Welcome everybody. So hopefully you're having a good uh, couple of days. It's always a really big event um, to try and find time for two day workshops. But um, yeah, we appreciate everybody turning up and being involved. You know, we think it's in, important to be out in industry, to understand industry and to get feedback and viewpoint from industry professionals as well. So I said, um, as was introduced, I'm Andrew Hill. So I look after the Cloud A2K business. I've been around the chops a little bit. So um, worked in the consulting side for a number of years though. So started life in engineering. So worked at a university for a number of years as both a great research graduate and a lecturer. Um, then worked for a consulting engineering company for a number of years before moving into the consulting side. Um, where I've worked for a reseller and worked for Autodesk and now for Cloud A2K in, um, in really looking at strategy. So I just wanted to look, go over a few things today and try and keep this fairly open as well. So you know, if there's um, comments, questions, please feel free to jump in and throw them out there because um, I like to have things a little bit interactive. If you, you have a question that you want answered, please let me know because I think it's important for us to be able to get there. But you know, I think there's a few question, questions that I always go over with people, which is, how did we get where we are today? So you know, the construction industry has evolved, um, things have changed, but, but why are we where, where we are today? And then really looking at what's changed in our industry and what's driven some of those changes that we're dealing with. Um, how we're keeping pace with other industries, because if we look at construction, it is a little bit behind many of them. And then really fi finishing off with what we can do better. So you know, that's, these are the sorts of things that I want you to think about as a group today um, when we go through. So as an industry, we've been through four industrial revolutions, which have facilitated a massive amount of change since the 1700s. So the first change that we went through was really around the mechanisation, where we actually used water and steam to start powering equipment and actually leading into what was the first and early implementation of factory environments. Nothing was mobile, it was all fixed because it was uh, so heavily driven on steam and um, water, but it led to this whole process of the first steps in automation. And first steps in automation is, was really required at that time to lead to strategies around how we can be better at looking at um, you know, moving production line and increasing the way we produce uh, equipment and materials. Around um, 1870 is when we started to move into our second industrial revolution, which is where we were really focused around electrification. So around the time that we had electricity as a primary power source and the ability to use that power to then start making machinery smaller. Um, and as soon as we had the ability to make machinery smaller, suddenly we had mobility. So we went away from having fixed factories to mobile factories. And that ability that we could then start changing production lines based on requirements. So, and it was a really important phase for us because that's the sort of a foundation of when the motor, motor industry started to really look at how they could um, automate processes and really start working with the way that we went through and looked at how factories operated. And it was something that had never happened before that second industrial revolution where we were dealing with what had actually happened. So the third industrial revolution, which started in 1969, was probably a key driving force because in the 1970s we had electronic devices that made it possible to automate things based off of logic. So suddenly we weren't relying on just a machine making a decision or doing something. We had computers that could then start supplying logic and using that logic to actually make decisions for us. Um, and that logic actually again changed the way that we thought about the industry because suddenly we didn't have to think of what we could do, we had to think about what we could program and how we could program things to actually really reflect on a decision. So we had to, had, to, had to start thinking not in terms of just movement of materials, but we had to think in processes and what was required to move from one process to another process. Um, and it sort of started to really change the way that we thought about uh, manufacturing in general terms, but also the supply chain <coughs> overall and how things came together. <coughs> that led us to 
where we are today, which is the fourth industrial revolution. So it really started in 2011. Um, so, and built around some of those really key technologies and, and evolution around computing. When we move into things like IoT, um, where we can start manufacturing with intelligent techniques and intelligent actions. So we actually use sensors to actually understand and track movement for us, and we use it to analyze what we're doing. So when we start to go into things like robotics, generative design, augmented reality, all of these types of things are things that have come through in that fourth industrial revolution. And you know, it really leads to what impact has that had on the construction industry? And it's really interesting as we reflect back and try to look at where we are. So what has changed over the last eight years in construction, now core construction? I can go back and say the third industrial revolution had some massive changes for us. Because we had things like microprocessors. First microprocessor was invented during that time. First microprocessor led to the fact that we then had the first computer. That first computer meant that we could then have the first CAD station um, and we could start automating a drawing process based off of that. We also had the first Windows operating system, which led to a whole bunch of things like email um, being available and the ability to actually communicate from a computer rather than a telephone. We had our first mobile phone, so no longer did we have to rely on landline. Suddenly we could all communicate wherever we were um, and using that technology. And we had the first CD-ROM. Um, so anyone that was used to a five and a quarter floppy disk, probably not many in this room, um, you know, we went from only being able to store in the vicinity of 740K to 1.44K to suddenly having infinite storage on a disk drive that allowed us to sort of start progressing. So we had some massive changes as we went through that third industrial revolution. And it was something that sort of really changed the way, especially in the design sense, what we thought about. So if we sort of look at this holistically, we moved from a drawing board to a CAD station, where we went from everything being very manual to everything being automated. That allowed us to then be able to start drawing at a full scale, manage changes, a whole range of other things. We moved from a telephone to a mobile phone, which meant we were now able to communicate with people regardless of where we were. We went from physical libraries and storage of books and hard copy content or catalogues, whatever we were dealing with in an office, to the internet, where we could actually use that internet to start locating and finding data for us. Um, we went from fax machines to email as a primary force of communication, and especially when we're dealing with contracts and legal documents, it was a big transition as we went from faxes to emails. But then we evolved further from a mobile phone to a smartphone where we had the internet available to us on our phones. Um, we could use it for actually storing data and working and actually utilizing additional information that we had. And we evolved from CAD in a 2D sense of having lines, arcs and circles into a very model-based environment in BIM where we actually reflected true elements and an understanding of what we were creating in terms of objects, not lines. So ultimately that whole in third industrial revolution meant that we moved from an analog era into a digital era. And that was a major transition for us. So, and it was something that really evolved us as an industry in an initial phase. And if we look at that in terms of design, so when we moved from the drawing board to CAD, suddenly we had now the ability to draw and reference at a scale of one to one. So whatever size it was, is the size that we drew it. So we weren't no longer scaling down onto a piece of paper to understand something. We had the ability to make changes on a drawing and then those changes would be updated for us without us having to redraw it. We had the first reusable content so suddenly, you know, we'd look at this being BIMMEP Oz as a conference, very much focused around the content of the building um, industry and especially around sort of mechanical components that we're working with. 
suddenly that was reusable and available to everybody across an office. We now have the ability to measure, so suddenly we didn't have to worry about scale rules, we could actually click on a line and understand how long that line was going to be. We understood working in disciplines or different layers, so I could actually categorise a drawing based on what I was creating. So I didn't have just like different line thicknesses of pen, I could actually say if I was doing a wall or if I was working in an architectural sense, a building services sense or a structure sense and actually break my drawing up so that I understood it. And I had the ability to share content including drawings across an entire project team. We then evolved into that next evolution when we were moving from lines, arcs and circles into model elements and understanding them. So suddenly I can now coordinate in three dimensions and I know when I was lecturing at university and it was in engineering and I used to try and get my first year students to understand the concept of thinking in three dimensions and it challenged them. They could never really understand the concept of a z-axis um, in design and when they looked at a line they had this sort of skewed reality that if I showed two points that's how long this line was. They never really understood the concept of z-axis and something coming out of the screen at you, um, even with multiple views. But suddenly we could actually do that and coordinate in those three dimensions. We could actually analyse. So because we're dealing now with model objects rather than lines, arcs and circles, we could have properties. So whether that's flow data, whether that is around a luminosity, whatever it may be in terms of materials that we're working with, we had the ability to apply metadata to it that can be analysed for some other function. So whether that is around performance, whether it's around acoustics, it doesn't really matter, but we had the ability to start putting that. It also opened up access. As the internet got faster, suddenly we can now share entire models across an entire ecosystem of design. So regardless of who wanted to access that design inside a um, model environment, it was now available to everybody. Um, we could actually build in material properties, so suddenly we could actually say how something was constructed, um, what it was made of, uh, certain values that were associated with it. So if I wanted to know if something was fireproofed, I could actually validate that directly from my model. It also opened up the whole concept of visualisation. Um, we didn't have to rely on just someone building up a fancy picture for us to understand a 3D model and what it would look like, we could take it directly from the model and visualise it and understand it and everybody could actually then utilise that in terms of, of um, an assessment or a review or public endorsement or whatever it, what it could be. And then suddenly because we're now thinking in these three dimensions, we can review constructability. Um, and there's a caveat to that, that we have to have a constructible model, but we could review constructability. So we can start doing things like constructability analysis and actually seeing if what we've designed could be built and if that's the best solution. So that evolved a lot across that third industrial revolution. But the problem was, there was a big, as soon as we started talking about construction, it's like run away, that's not our area. Um, and it was almost like keep out of construction, that's our space. So we used to have these really intelligent designs but we'd get to site and what would we have? Everybody would be walking around with a sheet of paper, um, everybody would be walking around with their plans, schedules, all of our estimation was handled from Excel spreadsheets, manual measurements off of a 2D drawing and we'd still revert to a printed drawing to actually understand. And it was interesting, I was um, on site at a semiconductor plant in Singapore uh, less than a year ago where they were doing a new fabrication plant upgrade and they had one entire room that was probably as big as this and it was just full of drawings and full of paper and full of everything that we were dealing with. So that was for a project that was fully designed in BIM. So they had everything coordinated, all of the drawings were co coordinated, all of the services were included, yet as soon as it got to the construction site there was a room this size filled with paper documents that used to be carried around on site. 
And that was a real concern to us um, because what happened is we were not utilising what had happened in the design phase. And we were not taking that information from design and then making it work for us in the construction industry. And that went to things around automation as well. And I don't know if anyone's heard of a little company in West Australia called Fast Bricks, I think they're called, but you know, they did this whole concept of being able to lay and build an entire brick residence in three days um, by using an automated brick laying machine. Fantastic, you know, a big sign of taking automation to site. Pre-construction, another way that we can really, really help and work with what we're dealing with on site. But we have all of these perils that as soon as we get to site, there's a whole bunch of safety issues and concerns that when we look at them, it's like, how could I make that machine work? Because in a really nice and clean site um, where it's flat, it's tidy, I can get things like automated brick laying machines on site, but as soon as I'm on a real construction site and I'm a real construction manager and I have a real project to deliver and I have real deadlines, some of these things I just are going, that's too hard. How could I possibly coordinate that? And how could I possibly work with it? And I think that's always been the biggest challenge for us in the industry, which is how do we actually take what happens in an office and move it onto site? So that leads into what this has driven, which is a major study, um, well, every major study in the world around different industries and digitization, all agree that construction is the least digitized sector in the world. Less than agriculture, um, less than, you know, pretty much everything. So it is the least digitized industry in the world. And that is all because of this lack of reuse that we have when we move to construction. So, and it's something that we need to take on board as an industry and we need to understand and we need to be able to evolve and we need to actually look at how we change it. Because as we move into where we are today, which is the fourth industrial revolution, there's a whole range of things that become important for us. And the World Economic Forum um, actually had a big seminar talking about the fourth industrial revolution and its impact on the construction industry. And they came up with a whole bunch of things that they said was going to drive it. Robotics, artificial intelligence, IOT, autonomous vehicles, you know, already seen that on mining sites, but it's you know, something that's there. 3D printing and the use of 3D printed technologies nanotechnologies, biotechnologies, um, not so relevant to the construction industry, but it's one that they had in there, and quantum computing to make everything accessible in a high period of time. You know, and it's really interesting when we look through this and say, well, what out of this can we do today and what can we do well? We can do robotics, we can link into AI, we can do 3D printing, but not so much for a building. Autonomous vehicles, yep, but they're not prevalent. So there was a um, university in Europe that had actually done a fairly comprehensive study last year. And this was the things that, this was their roadmap, you could say. This is what they thought the industry would look like over the next seven years from last year. So, and they went into things around software as a service being um, the primary source of communication by 2018. Now, we're in 2019 now, and I can clearly say that software as a service isn't our primary source of, of accessing information. Not many companies and organisations reside in the cloud now, um, and that's what you have to do to be in a SaaS environment. AR and IoT, so using augmented reality and IoT, being really established across construction industries. Um, I know some companies that do much better than others, and there's one construction company in here today that does things pretty well. Um, but in terms of looking at this in a true AR or using IoT and using data properly, same thing. Like, I don't think we're anywhere there. Um, prefab, pre-construction, 3D printing, you know, 
taking site and being safer on site by having as much constructed off-site as possible. It's happening a little bit now. Um, will that happen by 2020? I'm really sceptical to think that that's going to happen with where we are today as well. Drone monitoring, so um, there's already been a lot of legal issues with drone monitoring around sites in various countries. Um, dealt with them in, especially around Singapore and the Middle East um, in two areas in particular where I've seen major issues with it. But by 2021, they are saying that drone monitoring regulations will around round the clock drone access for scanning sites and making sure that construction meets des um, design and schedule. Self-guided machines integrated into the work sites by 2022. AI managing its first project by 2023. If that happens, I'm going to be a really happy person. You know, and again, I'm just not sure that it will. Autonomous machinery guiding its first construction project by 2024 and a less people for manpower and a new tech rise by 2025. And it's interesting when we look at that and reflect on it with, is that possible and do people feel scared about it? You know, um, as soon as people start talking about less people for manpower in the industry, it's really interesting because then everybody starts to worry for their job. And I think anyone that's here from the construction industry, and you know, hopefully we all are, will understand that we are already in desperate shortage of resources. We don't have enough people now to facilitate what needs to be done just to substantiate growth um, in our industry. If we look at infrastructure, um, just to upgrade infrastructure around the world, they're talking trillions of dollars just in that. That's without looking at increased housing, um, increased hospitals, increased schools, increased power plants to support all of those things. That's just core infrastructure. So we're already in desperate needs. So if anybody wants to work till they're 90, they're definitely going to be able to um, because we're just not going to have enough people in this industry. But I thought that that was a really, really good study that they went into and a really good way to look at it. Um, yeah, I'd be curious. Does anyone have anything else that they think should be on a table like this? Because I looked at it and I thought it was actually a fairly good model um, or you know, a good step around everything that's happening through that fourth industrial revolution. But when we go through it, everything that we were talking about is looking at data. So it's looking at how can we capture data, how can we store data, how can we use the data and how can we analyse data on a project? Because data is going to be the new king. There's a lot of articles that actually talk about organisations having a stock value on data by the mid-20s and having a C-level person whose role is only managing data with inside organisations. So, that's a really interesting concept when we go into it because that use and reuse of data suddenly is so valuable to organisations that they actually are putting a stock value and a price on it in managing it. But there's a few things about data when we step into it, which is if we're looking at data in terms of you being able to reuse it, we have to have standards. We have to have specifications. We have to have schemas and workflows that go with that data. And we have to have structure around it. And if we don't have any of those things, then suddenly that data is just going to be a binary on-off number that means nothing to us. There's a whole talk, you know, when we went through the knowledge year and everyone wanted to have knowledge managers in their business, that was all around taking data and converting it to knowledge with inside businesses. This is no different, but we're taking data and we're analysing it for decisions that help us in the future. And that's where we need to be. So what's held us back? We've had a really, really good go at looking at level of development in the construction industry for design, where we actually fully understand 
a whole range of information around graphical attributes that we work with. Heights, volumes, locations, orientations, eleva elevations, materials, all of these types of things. From a graphical sense, we have been very good with the way that we work. The problem is that all projects have equally as large amount, if not more, embedded in non-graphical information. Our estimating, our construction coordination, our clash detection requirements, our scheduling, our quantity takeoffs, IT requirements, controlling functions within the software, collaboration requirements, lifecycle analytics, all of these things that aren't graphical, we can't see them on a drawing, but they are the things that are going to actually drive a change for us across the construction industry. So when we talk about the construction industry evolving into the fourth industrial revolution, it has to be around all of this non-graphical information and then where that non-graphical information is structured, where it's placed, where it's controlled, where it's managed. Because a lot of people will talk about, oh, well, we just have to have it all in the model. If we did that, we'd never be able to consume a model. So we have to look at the best fit for it. So we've built some amazing buildings um, and projects over the years. And now we actually have to look at what all of these type of industries have associated with it. How do we bring in connectivity, automation, IoT, the cloud, systems integration, mixed reality and AI, and then all of that leading into big data. So one of the things that I tried to do was to sort of just have a look at this in a holistic sense with what that would look like in terms of a workflow. So we all know we have a design model and our design model is so data rich that it's incredible these days. The first thing we need to do is understand how does that become a construction model? Because there's one thing to say I have a slab, there's another thing to say how is that slab going to be manufactured? There's one thing to say I have a column, another thing to say how it's broken up. Same with all of our building services. So we need to go from a design model to a construction model that goes through the analysis of our big data, may link into AI, definitely link into some cloud computing, and probably linking into some VR or MR, mixed reality environments, so that we sort of understand where that goes. Once we know it can be built, then we have to estimate that project and actually understand the cost controls. Hopefully we've been doing some cost control earlier, but it allows us to actually jump in and actually understand the cost of actually building this based on the construction methodologies that we put in place. And so it's the same thing, we have to link into our big data, we have to link into the cloud, we have to link into our um, AI or artificial intelligence that will make decisions for us and actually start utilising that. We need to understand our schedule and our schedule is the same. Using the data that we have available, maybe storing that in the cloud, maybe using um, AI for decisions and then that's going to give us a simulation so that we can see then clearly what that construction is going to look like. Once we understand what that construction is going to look like, then we can start moving into procurement and subcontractor packaging. Same thing though, we use all of the same data that we've had, we package it up, we make decisions, smart decisions based off of historical data through AI, um, we pass it out through the cloud and we make it accessible to everybody. Once we've actually had the ability to pass that, then we have to go through all of our site activities and understanding what all of those site activities start to look like. And we need to make it mobile and we need to make it not paper centric, but data centric on digital applications that we have available today. And it has to be reportable so that we can actually understand in a reporting sense everything that's happening as part of that. So it's got to be available on our computers, our tablets, our phones, and actually have it there so that we always have access to this data regardless of the format. And that's where we start linking into some of the IoT structures, the big data structures, AI, cloud, and the VR um, qualities as well as part of that. And finally, we start finishing off with project analytics. Because 
the only way that AI is going to evolve and the only way we're going to get smarter is by making better decisions. The only way we can make better decisions is by understanding historically what we've done, what caused us problems and what worked well. So that sort of then leads us through to this whole concept that by using data as the key and data as the foundation for actually driving construction as well as design, suddenly we don't just have smart design, we have smart design and construction. And that's what we have to achieve, looking at how we start utilising that data better. And there's ways that we can do that, and they're all very process driven. So we really have to focus on what data are we capturing, what are our processes for capturing it, what are our processes for analysing it, and what are our processes for reusing it. So the big thing around that is that's just a massive change to us and a change to the industry. Um, I pulled this slide out, but one of uh, my co-workers said, you should put this back in, I love that comment. Pace of change has never been this fast and will never be this slow again. So this was Justin Trudeau um, at the World Economic Forum in 2018. He's not the only person to have said this comment, by the way. It's been said quite a few times. But it's really apt because although things are changing fast, it's never going to change as slow or it's never going to be this slow again in the future. Change is only ever going to increase. So we sort of look at it and we go, well, why do we need to change then? Why do we have to digitise? And that digitisation really comes through efficiency. If we look at the manufacturing industry, non-value waste on a project is 26%. Still sounds high, um, but it's acceptable. So they have 26% in non-value added processes, waste in non-value added processes in manufacturing. As soon as we go to construction, 57% of our projects are waste. And that's phenomenal. Like over half of what we do is in non-value added services and processes. So it's important for us to start of sit back and look at it and say, if we could replicate the automotive industry and reduce construction waste to 26%, what would be the impact on a project? And if you actually sit down and crunch the numbers and look at the maths, which I did because I saw this study and I tried to work it out, the number I came up with was around about 18%. So you could actually save 18% on a project just by cutting waste from 57% to 26% on a project. And that's a fairly substantial change and something that we need to look at. So. You know, I said we compare this back to the automotive industry. The automotive industry for a long time has been all about digitisation. They digitised their models, they digitised their factories, they digitised their debugging and they digitised their manuals or their, their what we would classify as facilities management. But for us, we still went back to a 2D plan we still had very antiquated construction sites. Debugging for us was somebody walking around and finding a massive error. And our manual, which is our as-built documentation, usually sat in a folder and threw away in a cupboard somewhere um, and then forgotten about forever. So we weren't using data. So that key for us is to say we have a digital building information model. We need, now need to move to a digital construction site by using that data effectively for all aspects, moving into digital debugging, using the model itself for actually understanding errors on site, and then having that digital manual that links into our effective facilities management as we go forward. So McKinsey did a really good study around what disruption means to the construction industry. Um, and it was called the construction industry is ripe for disruption. And they actually came up with five key initiatives in driving it. Higher definition survey and geolocation, um, 5D building simulation modeling, digital collaboration and mobility to site, 
the Internet of Things and actually utilising the, the um, IoT information better and future-proof design and construction methodologies. So that's a really small little study that McKinsey put out. So I'd recommend everybody go and download it. Um, you can, everyone can go and grab it, it's just on the internet. And it's just really good at going through and talking about these strategies. But for me, as I said, you know, I only had a short period of time to talk to you guys, so I just wanted to go through and talk about what I think we need to do. It's all gonna be around the use and reliance on data we have to look at how we use that data better from design because historically we've been very good in the design phase but as soon as we get to site we either don't care about it if we're designers or we don't know how to use it if we're contractors um, and we need to look at how we change that so three things that I want you to all think about which is how do you use information across an entire construction process rather than just in the design phase. What tools and techniques, what things can we do that make it smarter for us to actually link in and utilise that information? What digital processes do people need to adopt or do you need to adopt as an organisation that will help support innovation and change in the construction industry? Because as an industry we need to innovate to keep up with pace. And how can we reimagine construction and actually move it to the 21st century, implementing everything that's available to us now inside Industry 4.0. Because Industry 5.0 is just around the corner. And we think that quantity, uh, um, things around quantum computing is fast. As soon as we start moving into the next generation, that's going to be exponentially faster again. So if we're not accessing, if we're not utilising and capturing data properly, we're going to be left behind. So it's really important for us to really think about these questions and understand what you need to do to re-engineer and reimagine construction. Um, that's all I had, guys. So I said I just wanted to give you a bit of an overview of my thoughts and a bit of a brain dump. And any questions? Um, let me know, otherwise enjoy the rest of your day, guys. Is there any questions? No? Nope. Oh, yep. Just on that last McKinsey's report, where does uh, like off-site prefabrication or pre-assembly sort of fit into that? Yep, so when they talk about future-proofing design and construction, they have a whole section in there around um, prefabrication. So prefabrication sort of comes into that fifth, fifth step that they're talking about. Um, because you know, there's a, they have a big emphasis as well, and there's another study from McKinsey around prefabrication um, as well. If you want to give me details, I can send you a couple of links to a yeah, whole bunch yeah. of McKinsey reports. But yeah, they, they have another one that goes into it. But they, when they talk about that future future proofing design, prefabrication all falls under that. They're looking at evolution in de design methodologies or construction methodologies um, to make it smarter once you hit site. So that all falls under there. Because a big part of this is... Well, it's just, mate, I mean, going towards not a building site, it's an assembly site. Yep. It's yeah, it's, it's, it's moving away from classic construction sites so that everything is modular. It's more about modularisation. The same as we did in automotive, where we modularised factories. Yeah. It's about modularising construction. Some assemblies coming instead of parts. I thought those 50, 70 million dollars that you saw in the construction, what are the major ones that became very obvious? Yep, so RFIs, so where people have a question on site. The average RFI, there's, a, there's another study that talks about the cost of RFI. So any time that there is a request for information or, or something, someone needs clarification on the construction site. The average cost in US dollars for rectifying an RFI was $7,000 and, and involved I think it was something like 12 people to actually go through and do it. So that was, there was a major factor around RFIs and, and errors on site that needed to be reviewed. Um, the other one was around material wastes. So people ordering wrong materials or ordering too much of something or having equipment there for installation when the materials weren't ready to be installed. They were the two biggest drivers of waste across that 57%.